Hello, I'm Alex Jones, a syndicated radio and television host based in Austin, Texas. And for many years, I've been exposing the criminal activities of the global elite, also known as the New World Order. And this collection of power-mad megalomaniacs has been using a successive string of terrorist events to usher in their corrupt world government, a world government where populations, their own documents show, will be herded into compact cities, will be issued national ID cards, and yes, even implantable microchips. But in this film, we're first going to look at some historical examples of tyrants and governments, oligarchies alike, using crises, in many cases, terrorist events that they themselves perpetrate against their population, against their own bureaucracies to create a crisis, to get the people to exchange liberty for so-called security. We're going to look at some historical examples of this, going back to Nero burning Rome to blame it on the Christians, and then fast forwarding to Adolf Hitler burning the Reichstag shortly after being elected, the governmental building, to blame it on his political enemies, to destroy their Bill of Rights and Constitution, and to announce martial law. Then we'll look at the Northwoods document from 1962, where the Joint Chiefs of Staff and many other sectors of the federal government to the highest levels were planning to blow up airliners full of Americans, full of American citizens. Then we're going to fast forward to the federal government training the drivers, cooking the bomb in the horrible attack, the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They were caught doing it. It was in the news, but got brushed aside. The FBI was caught on videotape admitting it, bombing the World Trade Center complex to get their agenda through. Then, of course, 1995 with the Oklahoma City bombing. Again, staggering amounts of evidence, an absolute proven fact that the government had prior knowledge and was instrumental in engineering the attacks on the Alfred P. Murrow building in Oklahoma City. And then, of course, none of you have to be reminded of the tragic events in 2001 on September 11th. My friends, the government just didn't have prior knowledge of September 11th Al-Qaeda attacks. They actually funded, trained, protected, coddled, shepherded Al-Qaeda into this country, trained many of the terrorists at the Pensacola Naval Air Station, USA, threatened FBI and defense intelligence officers who tried to stop Al-Qaeda, threatened them with arrest. Bush signed, now public document, W199I, two months before September 11th, threatening them with arrest if they tried to stop Al-Qaeda. And now his approval rating went from 45% to 
to 90 plus percent. The USA Patriot Act that has just eviscerated the Bill of Rights and Constitution has been passed. And yes, it pertains to Americans. Their cashless society, compact city, control grid is falling into place. The people were preconditioned before all of these terrorist attacks to give up their liberties. And then the government will be able to protect them from terrorists. Look at who really stands to gain from this. Look who has the motive. You know, we tripled the FBI's anti-terrorism funding in 1996 after Oklahoma City. They didn't protect us in 2001 from Al-Qaeda, did they? No, they funded and protected them. Took their names out of the customs computers. Took their names out of the airport computers. Nurse been alive and back to health in a U.S. hospital. You're going to see all the evidence. We had a war on drugs. There's triple the heroin, double the cocaine on our streets. Government's own numbers than there was eight years ago. Our prison population has gone from 1.3 million to 6.5 million in the last two years, going into 2002, with the numbers only expanding. We had a war on poverty. There's more poverty. A war on illiteracy. There's more illiteracy. Now they're going to have this war on terrorism. You're going to see only escalations in it because the government only gets more power, more control over our lives, more funding after each horrible event. A dozen people die at the first World Trade Center attack, 168, Oklahoma City, 3,000 plus, the second World Trade Center attack by the government. And now they're telling us, get ready for more attacks. And yes, if we don't take microchips, if we don't accept a microchip population, then we're going to get attacked again. And already the states admit they'd already been implementing a national ID card scheme. And then, of course, the total goal. Why the New World Order is pushing all of this. We know they want tyranny. We know this global government is behind it. They're now publicly talking about a New World Order. How did they get all this? And what's their final goal? A world population reduction of 80%, everyone crammed into compact cities, and yes, the United Nations is preparing to release mass plagues on the earth because the elite want the life extension technology for themselves. They know that technology is a double-edged sword that can be used to empower humanity or that can be used to totally enslave humanity. And they know they're in a race against time, that their window of opportunity is closing. And they've got to dehumanize us. They've got to enslave us here on the global plantation now or they're going to lose control. The New World Order is run by absolutely ruthless individuals, hell-bent on dehumanizing the entire human community, obsessed with total control. These megalomaniacal Satanists are absolutely sworn to the creation of a worldwide tyranny called the New World Order. This is the evidence, and it is conclusive. 911, the road to tyranny. War. Empires are built and maintained by it. Populations rally during time of war. Nothing centralizes power like it on Earth. All throughout history, leaders have used this unifying force to control populations. Humans instinctively shift into mindless groupthink when faced by an outside threat, whether real or manufactured. But now, in the 21st century, the system of control continues, but with more sophistication. You see, if there isn't an enemy to fight, you have to manufacture one. In AD 64, on the 10th of August, Nero, Emperor of Rome, set the city ablaze while he fiddled. You see, he had a problem. The Christians were getting too popular. Of course, after he torched Rome, the people were more than happy to rip them limb from limb in the arena. The persecution of the Christians is only one of many ancient examples of governments persecuting populations after creating crises. On February 15, 1898, treason was committed by William McKinley's Navy when they blew up their own ship in Havana Harbor to create a pretext for war with the Spanish government. Adolf Hitler had already been elected president, but he wanted to abolish the chancellery and make himself fewer. And to do that, he had to create enough of a crisis to create massive levels of fear in the population so that they would willingly lay down their republic and give it into the hands of this monster. On the night of February 27th, 1933, Adolf Hitler's stormtroopers, historical documents now conclusively show from Nazi archives, burned the Reichstag government building to the ground. A wave of arrests then took place across the Reich as the Fuhrer 
told the people, yes, I will protect you. You will have a utopia world. Everything will be given to you by the state as long as you offer total fealty and support of your Fuhrer. The people bought the utopia and were totally enslaved. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. It may have been a surprise attack to the American people, but not to the federal government and the military. Months before the attack, they knew the Japanese were preparing for an all-out assault in the Pacific. And now even the History Channel admits, as well as any other historical record, that Roosevelt, 12 days before, knew the actual date of the attack. They had Admiral Yamamoto's communique saying on the morning of December 7th, we'll attack the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor and deal a death blow. Roosevelt had campaigned on keeping America out of the war. But his backers had been funding the Japanese war machine for years, as well as funding and encouraging Hitler's blitzkrieg. They needed a global crisis to bring in a global government and the birth of the United Nations. That's why six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had the Naval Command remove the code-breaking machines from Pearl Harbor as well as dismantle the radar. They had to have the crisis to create this global system of tyranny. Think of the dastardly deed they had committed, leaving our troops, our sailors, our boys to die. You see, the global elite had attempted to create a League of Nations at the end of World War I. World War II had to be bigger and on a larger scale so the people would say, give us a global government to protect us from these horrible wars. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. In the early 1960s, the federal government needed an excuse, a pretext to invade Cuba. Seldom do we see examples as sterling as the Northwoods document, where the federal government actually put the plan to paper. It was actually carried in published media reports in ABC News and, of course, the Baltimore Sun. The federal government proposed blowing up airliners full of Americans, saying that casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of indignation. The mad general, the architect of this plan, was General L.L. L. Lemonser, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff. He got approval for his Faustian plan all the way up to the Secretary of Defense. President Kennedy was not amused. In the plan, they elaborated on how they could bomb Washington, D.C. and blame it on Cuba attack Marines at Guantanamo Bay using U.S. Army soldiers dressed up as Cubans. Or, they said, just like the sinking of the Maine to get into the Spanish-American War, we could blow up a ship again. Here they are admitting the problem-reaction-solution system and how effective it is to motivate the American people to get them behind a war, a nuclear war with Cuba and the Soviet Union. And you didn't believe that the government was capable of hijacking its own aircraft and killing its own citizens. President Kennedy had always been a servant of the elite, but he was so shocked by the Northwoods document that he signed Executive Order 11110 shortly before his death, announcing that he would abolish the Federal Reserve System. He also began to pull us out of Vietnam and signed an order to abolish the CIA. It was at that point that he was assassinated. You see, he had decided to be a leader of the people, to defend their interest, and the New World Order couldn't allow that to happen.
Now you'll see the evidence of the federal government targeting the World Trade Center twice. October 28, 93, and October 31st, 1993, New York Times, as well as the December 15th Chicago Tribune. The federal government was actually caught on tape by their informants, ordering them to let the bombing go forward, to cook the bomb, to give the terrorists the detonators, to create yet another crisis, this time to usher in a police state and a war upon the American people. Unlike the Northwoods plan, the FBI actually carried out the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They actually hired a retired 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer, Ahmad Salam, and paid him $1 million and gave him real explosives, a detonator, and told him to build a bomb and to give it to the foolish people that he was controlling to allow them to attack the World Trade Center complex. There was only one problem with their plan. Mr. Salam was not as ruthless and sociopathic as the FBI and their globalist controllers. He began to get very concerned right before and, of course, after the attack, saying, why are you giving me real explosives if this is just a sting operation? When they told him to go ahead and let the attack go forward, he secretly recorded the head of the FBI in New York ordering him to let the bombing take place. It's very important to understand that all the evidence you just saw is documented, 110%. It is part of the public record. The FBI admits it, but the media wrote a few stories about it. There were a couple of nightly newscasts that was never heard of again. But unlike Pearl Harbor, where the government allowed the Japanese to attack as a pretext for war, the federal government financed and controlled this attack on the World Trade Center to create a system of anti-terrorism, to sick a homeland security system on the American people. There was only one problem. The drivers of the truck didn't park it up against the main support column as they had been ordered to do by Mr. Salam and the FBI. No, my friends, they parked it about a dozen feet away, and so it didn't bring down the building. And in consequence, they didn't get the massive death toll they needed to create the martial law system they were hell-bent on implementing against our constitutional republic and the American people. To the American people's heart, the feds finished the job on September 11, 2001. April 19th, 1995, in downtown Oklahoma City, multiple bombs ripped through the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building, and as usual, federal fingerprints were all over this tragic event. Then-President Bill Clinton, taking his orders from on high from the New World Order chieftains, needed a crisis to get his gun control agenda through, as well as his plans for a socialized America. Taking a page out of the strong men's handbook, Bill Clinton knew that a crisis of this magnitude, endless images of mangled children, would pull on the heartstrings of the American people, and they would beg for the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act that he had failed to pass just a year before. The bill absolutely eviscerated mass of sections of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We've been investigating this tragedy for over six years. The amount of evidence is staggering. Let's just hit some of the key points. Now let's get into it. ...station that that one explosion caused, because here's now what we are starting to learn about uh, the succession or what someone obviously hoped would be a succession of explosions. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. So try to imagine More. two or threefold happening mm -hmm. Uh, what we've already seen there. It is just uh, incredible to think that there was that much heavy artillery that was somehow moved into the downtown Oklahoma City Federal Building. Two other explosive devices were found that were not detonated and they were larger than the first. Oh. 
I think he said another bomb. Another bomb, move back. Oh, my God, another bomb. We uh, just saw, if you were watching there, there was a white pickup truck backing a trailer into the scene here. They're trying to move people out of the way so they can get it in. It appears to be the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad. Uh, it's their bomb disposal unit, essentially, is what it is, and it is what they would use to, if, if the report that we gave you just a few moments ago turns out to be correct, that they have found a second explosive device of some kind inside this building. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in, and they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am, and I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. So a total of three, a total of three. Now confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there, blowing off the entire north face of that building. Again, you're looking at the north face there, a second bomb was found on the east side of that building. A bomb squad is on the scene. That second bomb has not exploded. We don't know quite the status yet if they've managed to defuse it, but it has been confirmed that a second bomb was found on the east the side. The I have is that one device was, uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. So President Clinton just called Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosives expert. Um, obviously with this type of explosion. The medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. Still a lot of activity around the Morrow building. Uh, security concerns that another one still might go up. Fortunately, it didn't because the second device that they found, we understand, was even more powerful than the first. They then found a third device, and you can see the look on this woman's face at the fear that she might have to go through the same thing again. They then found a third device, which was also larger than the first. Uh, hard to feel lucky at this point, but certainly through uh, some good work by some munitions experts and the uh, explosive sniffing dogs, further tragedy has almost certainly been averted here. Uh, but it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. It would have been an incredible help to have been able to get a hold of those unexploded bombs. Unfortunately, the BATF, according to police and firefighter testimony, were inside removing them and spiriting them away because they had to keep their story straight that there was only one bomb, a truck bomb. Out of hundreds of people we interviewed, we couldn't find a single person who said they'd heard only one explosion. But you know, Did you live here, Charles, the time I of the bomb? I live here. I, I work right here in this building. I was at work. Did I you, was at work. Did you feel it? Yeah, I thought this building was blowing up. How many blasts did you feel? Two. And how far apart were they? Oh, probably about boom, and then it's boom. It's a historical fact, part of the public record, that there were multiple devices inside the Oklahoma City building and that there were at least two explosions. The emergency radio transmission transcripts show clearly that the police and firefighters were on the record witnessing the BATF removing unexploded devices. But you see, we have the actual scientific fact. We have the University of Oklahoma's own seismograph reports, as well as the U.S. Geological Survey reports, two different scientific institutions showing multiple explosions. But you see... McVeigh would have had to have had accomplices, and that didn't fit in to the federal story, especially if the reality showed that it had to be somebody who had access to a federal building for long extended periods of time.
General Benton K. Parton is the former head of Air Force Weapons Development and had over 30 plus years running the Air Force Weapons Development Program. He has multiple engineering degrees. General Parton was amazed by press reports claiming the building had been blown in and that a truck bomb could cause that damage. When even basic understanding of explosive signatures shows that the building was blown not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Within days of the blast, General Benton K. Parton was on the scene. But of course he was barred access. But from video as well as photographs of the columns, it was obvious to any trained eye that the columns had been blown off by shape charges. In a detailed report, the former head of Air Force Weapons Development laid out the physics, the mathematics. It was a physical impossibility for a truck bomb, even made of military-grade explosives, couldn't even begin to approach the damage that was brought against the Oklahoma City Federal Building. Now the seismographs come in. You see, the seismographs first registered one distinct explosion and then a group of explosions so close to each other that they couldn't be separated. You see, the feds had to have a diversionary blast. They had to be able to tell the world that it was that lone nut McVeigh out front. You see, they needed McVeigh's truck bomb outside so they could cover the fact that there was actually explosives inside the structure. And if you look at the actual crater that was there, it was so small it could hardly be measured. But later in media reports, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Another key piece of evidence that General Parton raises is that a single bomb explosion cannot account for the failure of column B, which was further from the truck bomb than columns B4 and B5, which did not fail. He concludes that the asymmetrical nature of the damage to the Murrow building is one indication of demolition charges were being used in the bombing. In modern history, literally thousands of structures of every type and design have been destroyed commercially to make way for new structures. But that didn't matter to the BATF, the federal government, and the media. They turned structural engineering on its head, demanding, telling the world, that a single truck bomb actually did this damage. And with this signature, that clearly showed that the building had been blown out, not in. Not only was the scientific and engineering world in shock disbelief, the general public wasn't buying the story because they'd seen what had happened. Now let's go to an actual news report the day of the tragedy. Some of the floors have just crashed together. I mean, there are some points where you just literally can't get in at all. And then from Chopper 4, at some particular points, we could see all the way through the building. That's the force of the explosion. It just blew out all the walls and everything inside. Blew out all the walls, blew out all the walls, blew out all the walls. Outraged by the federal cover-up, leaders from across Oklahoma, led by State Representative Charles Key, banded together to put together the final report, 550 pages detailing this criminal federal operation. Now let's look at the cowardice of the BAT. You see, they got a warning, but they didn't pass it on to the children in the daycare center. What he told him is that he thought that they had received a tip that morning of the bomb. Yet another witness, a rescue worker, says after she talked with an agent at the bombing scene, she also suspected the ATF was warned an agent stayed away from their office that morning. I asked him if his office was in the building, and he said yes, and I asked if there were any ATF agents that were still in the building, and he said, no, we weren't here. Witness number one approached an ATF agent nearby. He claims he asked the agent what had happened, and witness number one says this is what the agent told him. He uh, started getting a little bit nervous. He tried reaching somebody on a two-way radio. Uh, couldn't get anybody, and I told him I wanted an answer right then. He said they were in the briefing. None of the agents had been in there. They had been tipped by their pagers not to come into work that day. Plain as day out of his mouth. They were tipped. Why wasn't anybody else? There was a lot of people, good people, died down there. And if they knew, they should have let everybody else know. Oklahoma City paramedic Tiffany Bible, who heroically responded just minutes after the blast on April 19, 1995, swore in an affidavit that when she arrived, the BATF was in full mop gear, bomb gear, that takes at least 30 minutes to put on. When she asked them, oh my goodness, were you guys hurt inside the blast? They said, no, we got tipped off by our pagers not to come in today. Agents forewarned about a bomb in Oklahoma City. Did they know the Murrow building was a target? The ATF says no, absolutely not. But tonight in a story you'll see only on the news channel, you're about to hear otherwise from people who were at the Murrah building that morning. We're asking simple questions and we can't get any answers, so it makes us that much more curious, you know. Where, where, where the hell were they? 
The news channel did ask for a private meeting with ATF officials to discuss the credibility of these witness reports. But the ATF refused, saying they had no more to say on the subject. Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, and so did Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City. So we're meant to believe. But hundreds of eyewitnesses reported seeing Middle Eastern men crawling all over this operation. Let's look at John Doe number two. Because I sat there and I seen McVeigh was with another person. Do you have any doubt in your mind that there was a passenger in the rider truck? That's, that's even more. I have no doubt there was there was definitely a second person, no matter what. There was two people in this vehicle. John Doe number two, and there was a ten, $2 million price put on his head. And now they're saying there's no John Doe number two. And our witnesses picked out of photo lineups. The news channel shared the information and surveillance tapes of this man with the FBI. They've had some of that material long before our reports went on the air. In the building, and uh, I was looked out the window, and I seen uh, a daughter's truck, and I seen a man get out of the daughter's truck. She was just 10 feet away from the man depicted in this sketch when he stepped out of the rider truck. Oh, uh, he was all of complexion, and he was, uh, he had black curly hair. He was wearing the baseball cart, but it, his curls were sticking out of his head. Uh, he was short in the back, but uh, you could still see the curls in his hair. He was not American. He was foreign. You can tell by his his skin, his face, the way his face was. We asked if I Dan Vogel if John Doe number two is still part of the investigation. Does he exist? The answer, yes. The FBI is still trying to locate and identify John Doe number two. The man in our reports is Iraqi. Today, the FBI says they are not pursuing a Middle Eastern connection. This doesn't mean it has been ruled out. That could change tomorrow. State, local, and federal police around the country actually detained dozens of Middle Eastern men trying to exit the country. Former Iraqi Republican Guard officers like Al Husseini Hussein. Despite all this evidence, the Clinton Justice Department said, release them. We don't want to talk to them. There is no Middle Eastern connection. In the making of this documentary film, our team has interviewed scores of former FBI agents, current FBI agents, police officers, detectives who were on the scene and who worked the case. They detained, they arrested members of the Iraqi Republican Guard while trying to flee the United States. They would open up their bags and find blue jogging suits, bomb-making materials. They would try to hold them, try to charge them. They could have convicted them in front of a jury, according to my sources. But Bill Clinton demanded their release. Later, I interviewed David Shippers, the man that impeached Bill Clinton, that brought down the mob in Chicago. And David Shippers stated that the Oklahoma City bombing team was the same people involved in the World Trade Center attack on September 11th. And guess what? Al Husseini Hussein was actually working in the Boston airport. It's amazing. Now we see the grand plan of the feds. These people are actually working for them. All the evidence shows and the details are chilling. We'll also focus on surveillance cameras, cameras that caught the bombing on tape and maybe the men behind the bombing. The news channel has new information tonight that there's a chance surveillance tapes could be the smoking gun evidence. Now, we asked candid questions in a rare face-to-face -face meeting with ATF officials close to the investigation. We learned that video collected from downtown businesses the morning of April 19th may someday be played before a jury. Officials won't say who or what exactly is on the tape. However, Numerous sources have confirmed the tapes exist and that they reveal more than one bomber. So what evidence are they asking for? They're asking for video taken from the rider truck from the Rigi Towers. Well, Kevin, it's a question we've all been asking. We've been asking that question since we first broke the story that surveillance cameras aimed at the federal building could have captured all those involved on tape. Now, sources have confirmed those tapes exist and that they show more than one bomber. The FBI also confirmed those tapes exist when they refused to release them claiming the video is part of a criminal investigation. And now, for the first time, we get an on-the-record response from the head of the Dallas office, ATF. We learn that videotape could be unveiled as part of the prosecution's case. No officials, will, no officials will discuss specifically what's on the video, but we have been able to recreate some of what may have been captured by downtown surveillance cameras through the eyes of the witnesses. Now, you're looking at a computer recreation of the final movements of the rider truck according to the people who crossed its path at Fifth and Harvey. 
moments before the explosion. Tonight at 10, the witnesses will detail their memories of how they believe the suspects carried out the crime and made their getaway. Now, all these accounts share a common and unsettling similarity. The witnesses say they saw several accomplices, including the infamous John Doe No. 2. ATF officials tell us the elusive John Doe is still part of this case, but will not comment any further. However, they did tell us that there's a lot about this case we don't know yet. Information you can't find in the indictments against Timothy McVeigh, Terry Nichols, and Michael Fortier. It was just hours after the bombing when the News Channel first told you about the possibility that surveillance cameras may have captured the explosion and the killers on tape. Our sources and sources for the L.A. Times describe what's actually on those tapes. The information shows some huge surprises, the biggest that it may have been John Doe number 2, not Timothy McVeigh, who detonated the bomb. Brad Edwards has the latest on the investigation in this exclusive News Channel report. Our new information comes directly from a source that has seen parts of those surveillance tapes. It also comes from reports now in the Los Angeles Times. But perhaps the biggest surprise is contained in the News Channel's own information. Timothy McVeigh was not the last person to leave the Ryder truck. In fact, another man sat inside the cab of the truck after McVeigh got out. We believe that man is John Doe number two, a man who, for all we know, is still on the loose, leaving open a vital question. Was it John Doe number two who actually set off the bomb, not Timothy McVeigh, as we've all been led to believe? News Channel 4 has for weeks been demanding copies of the surveillance tapes from the FBI. The federal government so far is dragging its feet. But many people in the investigation have seen the tapes, and now so has a source willing to describe to the News Channel what the tapes show. The L.A. Times report shows there was a surveillance camera near the corner of 5th and Harvey and another near the corner of 5th and Robinson. Federal investigators recreated the time sequence leading up to the bombing by matching the video and still photos from the surveillance cameras. Since we can't show you the tape ourselves, we're reenacting what our source says he saw on those tapes. As witnesses told the news channel before, the tapes show the Ryder truck parked in front of the Murrah building where we now know the blast went off. As witnesses also told us, the tapes show two men sitting inside the Ryder truck. A man strongly resembling Timothy McVeigh gets out of the driver's side, steps down. He then appears to have dropped something on the step up into the truck. He bends down and appears to pick something up off the step. Then he turns and walks directly across 5th Street toward the Journal Record building. All this time, John Doe number 2 is still inside the Ryder truck's cab, sitting on the passenger side. Time passes. The surveillance tape is time-lapse photography. Without knowing exactly the time interval between shots, our source can't be sure how long John Doe number two sat in that cab. What was he doing all that time? Then the tape shows John Doe number two getting out of the passenger side of the Ryder truck. Again, the tape shows that a bombing witness accurately described what happened next to News Channel 4. I was standing in the building, and uh, I was looked out window and I seen uh, a Doris truck and I seen a man get out of the Doris truck. The tape shows John Doe number two getting out, shutting the passenger side door. He steps toward the front of the truck and is momentarily out of the frame of the surveillance camera. But shortly he appears back in frame, walking toward the rear of the truck, still on the sidewalk in front of the Murrah building. Again, he turns east toward the front of the truck, looking toward the street. John Doe number two then walks diagonally across Fifth Street toward the east, as if heading toward the YMCA or the intersection of Fifth and Robinson. He again leaves the frame of the camera. Another camera shooting from another angle clearly shows the actual explosion that destroyed the federal building and killed 169 people. So what does the mysterious John Doe number two look like in the tapes? The man who stayed inside the Ryder truck, possibly triggering the bomb? Well, his features are obscured by a baseball cap in the portion of tape seen by our source. The same kind of cap shown in the composite drawing first released of John Doe number two. The cap was a sports cap, flame style. The man himself was taller than the man resembling McVeigh and much thicker in build. He appears to have a dark or olive complexion. Our source saw only a few minutes of tape. He didn't see all of the almost 20 minutes of surveillance tapes that reportedly were distributed to FBI agents around the country to help in their investigation. But they do show enough to raise some crucial questions. Who actually set off the bomb? What was John Doe number two doing in the cab of the truck after the McVeigh lookalike got out? 
And how did John Doe number two get away from the Murrah building? Uh, my understanding is there was a video of McVeigh getting out of the rider truck, jumping into this other pickup with John Doe number two. Uh, well, where's that video? Are we ever going to get to see it? Do you realize what you've just seen, America? The government had multiple surveillance camera tapes. In fact, when it finally came out in court, when the federal government declared in 2001 that they wouldn't release the videotapes because of national security implications, that there were actually 12 surveillance camera tapes that had had these different Islamic individuals, these Arabic men with McVeigh and others, as well as the BATF uh, hiding out right down the street, uh, preparing to pounce on the operation and declare themselves the heroes, the saviors, the victims. Think about it. Now in 2001 and right into 2002, the federal government claims national security and refuses to release 12 plus surveillance camera tapes. What are they hiding? And the feds never tried to use it in court. I mean, if they had McVeigh pulling up alone and bombing the building and it was just a truck bomb, why not use the actual surveillance camera tapes to do it? But they didn't do that. You have to ask yourselves why. What's on that tape? <laughs> well, after you've seen all this evidence, it's clear. Federal involvement. Ratcheting up the police state right here in America. Danny Coulson, the FBI's top counterterrorism agent, checked into an Oklahoma City hotel nearly nine hours before a truck bomb nearly leveled the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building. The Embassy Suites Hotel receipt of Danny Coulson, the director of the FBI's terrorist task force and founding commander of the Bureau's hostage rescue team, was dated April 19, 1995, with a check-in time of 020. That's military time for 12.20 a.m. Almost nine hours before the blast, Chief Agent Coulson lied to the American people. He told a Time Magazine reporter in 1999 the harrowing tale of how he sped at over 100 miles an hour from his home in Dallas, trying to get there after the bombing to, to save people and conduct an investigation. Oh, and by the way, the FBI won't release any of the credit card statements and records for any of their agents. What are they trying to hide? The system wasn't working. Going through the system didn't work. I did everything that... Uh they advised me to do. It didn't do any good. Hoppy Heidelberg was an upstanding member of the community with no criminal record. He'd been a grand juror for years. But when he started asking questions about the Middle Eastern connection and FBI prior knowledge and BATF involvement, the FBI actually came to his house brandishing firearms and told him to shut his mouth if he knew what was good for him. When he refused to be part of the cover-up and demanded that he be able to call witnesses as his right as a grand juror, the judge kicked him off the case. Just one more piece of this massive cover-up. The news channel has learned of another strange development. Apparently, before the bombing, Governor Frank Keating's brother, Mark, had been working on a novel about a terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City. Stranger still, one of the characters in the novel was named Thomas McVeigh. Governor Frank Keating's brother, Martin Keating, wrote the final jihad. In the book, a Tom McVeigh masterminds the bombing of the Oklahoma City building. He dedicated the book to the Knights of the Secret Circle, a known Illuminati group. And he wrote the book two years before the bombing. The tragic events of Oklahoma City, if the truth was known to the public, makes it even more tragic, even more horrific. You see, it's now a monument to the police state, a monument to the sacrifice the government made of American lives, of American blood, of American tears, as an excuse to get the feds to be able to circle the wagons against the American people, to have a pretext, an excuse to expand their police state. They covered the whole operation up. It's clear that they had prior knowledge that multiple bombs were detonated on the inside of the building, that the feds have grabbed the 12 surveillance camera tapes and are refusing to release them, even in 2002. Threatening grand jurors, destroying the building and burying it under guard, the federal government blamed this tragic event on Christians, conservatives, gun owners. But if you look at the evidence, it's clear who's behind it, the federal government. And they use this just like Hitler used the Reichstag to get martial law cranking in America. $62 million is coming to Oklahoma soon to help anti-terrorism and disaster relief efforts. Government crime certainly does pay, especially when it's government-sponsored terrorism against its own institutions. That's right, the BATF locally got tens of millions of dollars extra funding, but so did every other federal agency that tries to control the American people. $24 billion increase in anti-terrorism funds. And after September 11th, they've now tripled that. 
and of course the BATF ensure that the building was completely demolished. So there couldn't be any evidence of their heinous acts. And that's right, ladies and gentlemen, they actually buried the building under guard at a private landfill with Wacken Hut guards protecting it from A to Z, federal fingerprints all over it, and doing everything they can to suppress the truth. For Bill Clinton, the servant of the New World Order, whose approval rating exploded after the attack, and his attack dog, the butcher of Waco, Reno. She was very happy to blame it on Christians and conservatives and gun owners. It was her excuse to expand federal control over local police and to merge the military with the police in new giant anti-terrorism training camps where the military and the police prepare for mass gun confiscation and extermination of the American people. Evidence of that's coming up later. We've seen the evidence of government-sponsored terrorism throughout history. Now let's take a closer look at what happened on September 11, 2001, and how it's being used to usher in a new world order. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. The Council on Foreign Relations, known as the CFR, an organization publicly sworn to destroy American national sovereignty and usher in a tyrannical world police state, could not contain their glee on September 12th, the day after the tragic attack. They announced their new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. There it is, the CFR actually admitting that this crisis was helping them to bring in a new world order, global government. And how would they get that job done? You see, for decades, going back to Jimmy Carter and Brzezny Brzezinski, the national security advisor, they had been breeding, creating these terrorist organizations, funding them and training them to attack America. Brzezny Brzezinski, co-founder of the Trilateral Commission with David Rockefeller and other luminaries of the global system, actually bragged in his 1998 book, these criminals love to brag, the grand chessboard of how America would be attacked by Afghan terrorists and how global government, a war for global government, would then take place in Central Asia. How it could be used to roll out national ID cards and a global police state here in the United States. All of this being planned back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The relationship between the CIA and the Afghan freedom fighters, the Mujahideen, even predates Ronald Reagan. The bonds that were forged there with the Central Intelligence Agency led to the creation of their super asset, Osama bin Laden, the rich Saudi Arabian sheik, whose family to this day builds all U.S. military bases in the Middle East, North Africa, and in Central Asia. It's on the record that bin Laden's a CIA asset, and every time an American president needs a distraction overseas, a ship or an embassy gets blown up. On October 12, 1998, the USS Cole, while docked at the port of Aden in Yemen, was attacked. 17 Americans were killed, 39 wounded. Sacrificed yet again on the altar of globalism. Just like clockwork, every time Bill Clinton was in trouble, an embassy, a ship, a barracks was blown up. Just like Oklahoma City, the CIA asset bin Laden was delivering time and time again, and Bill Clinton was there protecting him, refusing to allow foreign countries like Sudan, even Iraq and Afghanistan to give them the files of where Al-Qaeda was in the world and yes, where they were active even in the continental United States. Sudan even offered to arrest bin Laden three separate times. Bill Clinton answered by bombing with state-of-the-art cruise missiles their only pharmaceutical plant. Denying Africa, 
desperately needed medicines. You see, in reality, it's a lot bigger than just Republican or Democrat. The reality is the Central Intelligence Agency, controlled by Wall Street, has been grooming this creature and his family over the last 50 years to carry out dangerous projects in the Middle East, Central Asia, and North Africa. Back in 1996, the CIA worked in tandem with Pakistan to create the Taliban. Then in 1998, when the Afghans offered to arrest bin Laden, the CIA responded, publicly telling him to do no such thing. They needed this boogeyman for one more big action, and his family the entire time was being rewarded with giant satellite company deals, oil company mergers, and some of the biggest construction projects in the world. New world coming. America will become increasingly vulnerable to hostile attack on our homeland and our military superiority will not entirely protect us. Americans will likely die on American soil, possibly in large numbers. Americans will likely die on American soil possibly in large numbers, possibly in large numbers, possibly in large numbers. Shortly after September 11th, witnesses came forward documenting that bin Laden had actually met and planned the September 11th attacks with the CIA for 10 days in Dubai in an American army hospital. French intelligence was so upset by what they had learned that they actually got media reports published before September 11th, specifically warning that bin Laden was planning to hijack aircraft and fly them into tall buildings in downtown Manhattan, as well as the Pentagon. Of course, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, didn't need to be warned. First media reports that came out said that five of the hijackers had been trained at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. Later media reports in the Pensacola News Journal confirmed that three of the hijackers had been trained at the Pensacola Naval Air Station two years before September 11th. The San Francisco Chronicle also reported that one of the top lieutenants of Al-Qaeda was actually an FBI asset, not to mention a member of the U.S. Army. The next piece of evidence you're about to see is the biggest smoking gun of them all. President George W. Bush signed Presidential Decision Directive W199I, telling FBI agents as well as defense intelligence officers that if they tried to stop Al-Qaeda, they would be arrested under national security implications. It's been in every publication from the Wall Street Journal to the Washington Times. Actual lawsuits have now been filed by FBI agents who are outraged by the fact that they were not allowed to stop Al-Qaeda. The global crime syndicate that George W. Bush and his family fronts for has everything to gain from the September 11th attacks. A national ID card, a national control grid, a cashless society. It's part of the public record. George Bush signed the documents, threatening defense intelligence and FBI agents with arrest if they stopped Al-Qaeda. This is the most absolutely treasonous, treacherous thing he could possibly do. George Bush is a mass murderer. Before the Bush administration shut him down, CNN's American Morning with Paula Zahn actually reported that FBI Deputy Director John O'Neill resigned because he felt the U.S. administration was obstructing the FBI and their attempt to stop Al-Qaeda. They went on to report that Bush signed W199I restricting the investigation. Again, this is high treason, absolute fact. George Bush signed this public document. BBC has a copy of it. And George Bush is an intimate partner with bin Laden, a traitor to America. Months before September 11, 2001, Indian as well as Pakistani diplomats had gone public with the fact that U.S. Special Forces were massing in Tajikistan preparing for a full-scale invasion of Afghanistan. So the U.S. government was massing troops outside Afghanistan, publicly getting ready for an invasion right before September 11th. Another smoking gun! Another red flag! We already talked about the Deputy FBI Director John O'Neill quitting because George Bush signed an order not allowing him to stop Al-Qaeda. You're probably wondering, why doesn't he go public now? Well, there's a problem. Mr. O'Neill is dead. His new job was working as the head of security for the World Trade Center complex, and he died in the collapse of September 11th, his first day on the job. The Bush and Bin Laden family connection goes back over half a century. And by the 1970s, George Bush Jr., as well as Osama Bin Laden and his big brother, were already vacationing together, owning airports as well as oil companies together. Even before September 11th, the Wall Street Journal had called for the Bush family to end their relationship with the Bin Ladens. Then, of course, there's the Carlyle Group, the biggest defense contractor on the planet. And guess who the majority owners are? The Bush family and the Bin Ladens. They could profit in the hundreds of billions off of this new war. 
power. Now you begin to understand what's fueling these criminal activities. Money and power. Dozens of respected publications have asked a simple question. What brought those buildings down? Especially Building 7 that wasn't even hit by an aircraft. Lou Caccioli, a 51-year-old firefighter in New York who was trapped inside the building, reported that multiple bombs were going off all around him. There are other eyewitnesses, former military munitions experts and police officers, as well as structural engineers. The oldest firefighting magazine in the country was absolutely outraged, demanding a real investigation. According to their evidence, there's no way that aircraft could have brought down those buildings. And don't forget Building 7. Nothing hit Building 7, but still it collapsed in a symmetric fashion. The September 12, 2001 San Francisco Chronicle reported that Mayor Willie Brown was warned by the federal government not to fly on September 11th. He was warned the evening before. Now, of course, under pressure from the White House, Willie Brown refuses to say exactly what federal agency warned him, just that he was warned not to fly on September 11th. I wish the rest of the American people would have gotten that warning. But of course, if the American people would have been warned, then the government terrorist attack wouldn't have had its desired effect to have the people begging for a nightmare global police state. On September 3rd, Salman Rushdie, author of the Satanic Verses, got a warning from the U.S. authorities not to fly. They went so far as to ban him publicly from flying, and the FAA admits they did it on the record. More chilling evidence of the U.S. government's prior knowledge. But you're saying, hey, wait a minute, what was that whole war about? We went in there and took out the Taliban. No, they escorted a couple hundred goat herders to torture them publicly at Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay. The real leadership of Al-Qaeda and Taliban, the few that were left in Afghanistan when the war started, were flown out to safety and paid in gold bars in Pakistan by the U.S. federal government. Here's George Bush at the United Nations telling the people not to tolerate anyone that investigates these facts. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. I guess it's un-American to investigate the facts. Let's just call it a conspiracy theory. Especially those FBI agents that have gone public about George Bush telling him not to stop Al-Qaeda. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. What you're about to hear is not a Freudian slip, it's a carefully crafted speech, as Bush throws it in your face about dark cults of evil gaining power off of human suffering. The hijackers were instruments of evil who died in vain. Behind them is a cult of evil which seeks to harm the innocent and thrives on human suffering. Theirs is the worst kind of cruelty. The cruelty that is fed, not weakened, by tears. Theirs is the worst kind of violence. Pure malice while daring to claim the authority of God. We cannot fully understand the designs and power of evil. It is enough to know that evil, like goodness, exists. And in the terrorist Evil has found a willing servant. Evil has found a willing servant. Evil has found a willing servant. Five months before September 11th, David Shippers, the man that impeached Bill Clinton, that brought down the mob in Chicago, was actually getting investigative reporters on the O'Reilly Factor warning of an impending terror attack on Lower Manhattan. We'll take you now to an exclusive interview with David Shippers from my syndicated radio broadcast. I began to get information concerning the Middle Eastern connection in Oklahoma City. And We've had Colonel Craig Roberts, uh, who was a, a detective working the case on this show many times, a month before the attack, predicting one was imminent uh, right here on this show. Yeah. And he has all that same information. They actually arrested some of these guys, and the Justice Department in 95 said release them. That's right. And they, the word's out right even today that they're not allowed to touch them. The Oklahoma City Police are not allowed to touch these people. And again, from what I'm understanding, they're up to something again in Oklahoma City. I don't know what it is or what, what their target is, but uh, these same people are at it again. Now, Whenever later you got it from FBI agents in Chicago and uh, Minnesota that there was going to be an attack on Lower Manhattan. Everybody, yeah. I mean, it's everybody, and, and I would, that's what started me calling. Uh, I, I started calling out there. I first, of, first of all, 
I, I tried to see if I could get a congressman to go to bat for me and at least bring these people out there and listen to them. I sent them information, I, and nobody cared. It was always, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you. Then I reached out and tried to get to the attorney general when finally we got an attorney general in there that I would be willing to talk to. And uh, again, I, I used people who were personal friends of John Ashcroft to try and get him. One of them called me back and said, all right, I've talked to him. He will call you tomorrow morning. This was like a month before the bombing. The next morning I got a call. It wasn't from Ashcroft. It was from somebody in the Justice Department. One of his handlers. Yeah, and I, uh, I started telling him the, the situation. He said, well, you know, we don't start our investigations at the top. I said, I'd like to talk to the Attorney General because... This is vital. And he said, we don't start our investigations at the top. Let me look into this, and I'll get back to you. Well, as I sit here today, I've never heard from him. Now, again, David Shippers, I mean, you're big in Washington. You were the top lawyer that got Clinton impeached. You're highly respected. You know the senators, the congressmen. You're calling up. You've got these FBI agents and others feeding you this information. They're being pulled off the cases. They're angry. Uh, that's even been in the news now from Minnesota and Florida yeah. and, other, and, and Illinois. They know what's going to happen. Uh, the Sudanese in 96 and 98 tried to arrest bin Laden for Clinton, tried to give us the names of al-Qaeda. Clinton wouldn't take it. Didn't want any part of it. Wouldn't touch it. So we've got all this developing. Uh, we've got uh, police officers and FBI on the ground who know who bombed Oklahoma City. They've got them in custody with blue jogging suits and bomb-making components. Mm -hmm. um, they're ordered to release them. Uh, all this is unfolding, 3,500 to 5,000 Iraqi Republican Guard. We know there's a Saddam-Iraqi connection here. I mean, they knew this. Why in the world, David Shippers, did they allow this to take place is the question. Oh, I'll tell you something. This is one of the things that, uh, to me, it is almost inconceivable, inconceivable, that you know, with the knowledge they had that they would turn their back, just assume that they had investigated and going in after the Oklahoma City bombing, as they're doing now, there never would have been an attack on the Trade Towers. As a human being, as a former prosecutor, as a lawyer, as a guy who represents agents all over the United States, it is inconceivable to me that those bureaucrats in Washington would turn their back on, on the obvious for their own purposes. And now the World Trade Center complex is absolutely destroyed. Yeah, there's more coming. Now, you say that from your sources, I know you represent a bunch of FBI agents that are hopping mad. You probably can't talk about the specifics. You say they're, you're representing them. Are they getting ready to sue or something? Oh, well, they're hoping to. I don't want to get them in court. I want to get them into, a, into the Intelligence Committee, somebody who can go to these, uh, someone who has the authority and the ability to go to the FBI bureaucrats and say, butt out, we're going to do this right. I'm sure you're aware that on History Channel... Uh, they've been reporting for years. It's now confirmed that we had prior knowledge of the Japanese attack, and they allowed that to take place. Sure. And now you see the U.N. empowered, world court empowered. Looks like the U.N. is going to get to take over all that oil supply there in Central Asia. The, the face-scanning cameras were in trouble. Now they're on the fast track. Yep. Uh, this has sure brought the police state sure funding. Has. Sure has. And I've, I've been saying for years that um, once you have license, which we've had, next step is tyranny and it's it really is scary it, it the whole thing is scary the, the, the well, American there's people another... are saying I want to be safe and I will uh, who was it Ben Franklin said if you give up your liberties for security you will eventually lose both your security and your liberties absolutely what was the intel you were getting from these agents what were they saying this agent here in Chicago filed the affidavit where he laid out the whole way that the money moves, the way that it's handled, how it comes out of the Middle East into the, into the Chicago area, not only Chicago, but into the United States, how it's covered, how the operatives are covered, and then how the money gets back, how it's transferred back, and where it's kept while it's here. And that affidavit ran like 30 pages, laid it out. And they, uh, that was the only one. He had to go through hell on earth in Washington he had to fight like a tiger. Everybody in his own bureau and in the in the Department of Justice was against him. And still now, the FBI agents in Minnesota knew about all this and have the evidence, but they couldn't even get a wiretap or a warrant to search these guys. Exactly. And and we're talking about some of the actual hijackers. Exactly. And they, I mean, this um, and then this woman that uh, was talking to me, she had other contacts 
who were in naval intelligence and in other areas, and she was reporting that there was one of these terrorists that was involved or connected with the bombing in Oklahoma City was working at the Boston airport. One of my, uh, a friend of mine who happens to be an agent, had information showing that there were Hamas operatives working in baggage in areas at O'Hare Airport with free access to any part of the airport. But no one would listen. Clinton and his boys didn't want the, world, the, the United States to realize that Flight 800 was a terrorist attack and that the uh, Oklahoma City was a terrorist attack because they didn't want to have to admit that the, the intelligence of the United States was totally destroyed. Well, Craig Roberts uh, says it best. They wanted to demonize the patriots, exactly. the Christians, and uh, create this internal security force to watch Americans because, oh, the precious Arabs, they can't do anything wrong. That's what exactly what they started. Remember, the, I forget what nitwit it was that came out and said, you know, you can really blame some of the, uh, the Rush Limbaugh's and the talk show hosts who are fomenting this, this terror. Well, that was Bill Clinton. Clinton made that statement. I, this is, and they had a handy guy in McVeigh. They had a real handy guy. I also know, and I, I know this through affidavits that I've read, that there were people, eyeball witnesses, who saw the Middle Eastern man running from the scene alongside McVeigh. And why don't the feds just release those 12 surveillance camera tapes if it's just McVeigh alone? Those su surveillance camera tapes are going to show that there was a Middle Eastern man running with him. Some of these people who were who gave affidavits were interviewed by the FBI during the course of the investigation. They, they were interviewed about the second person they saw, and the agents tried to make them say that the second person was Nichols. Every single one of these people said, absolutely not. It was a Middle Eastern-type individual. Al Husseini. Now, listen to this. None of those 302s, none of those investigative reports have ever surfaced. So the FBI comes up with all these thousands of documents that they claim they overlooked, but the key ones where they tried to get them to say it was Nichols never surfaced. What were they saying about the attack on Lower Manhattan? Originally, the original report that I got was that there was, that, that they had arranged for three attacks on the United States. One, they were going to take down an airliner. Two, they were going to attack a federal facility in the, in the heartland of the United States. First one's TWA, Oklahoma City, right. in reverse order, and then now... And the third one was going to be a massive attack in lower Manhattan. The original plan was a suitcase nuclear, tactical nuclear weapon. These, the people that, were, that I was talking to were very, very, very credible people. And, uh, but... Okay, here's the bottom line question. Uh... You're getting intel, attack on Lower Manhattan, third big attack. What did you say? I mean, who did you talk to? I mean, we know you tried to get to the attorney general. And I tried others... to get to the attorney general. My first move was to go through some of the people I knew in Congress uh, to see if I could, uh, you know, somehow, because I was working on a two-front. It was really a two-front war. On the one hand, I wanted to get someone to listen to Jaina about Oklahoma City, but on the end, what was coming up, what may be coming up, on the other hand, I was trying to get somebody to uh, understand that Hamas is, has infiltrated the United States. I tried the House. I tried the Senate. I tried the, to get to the Department of Justice. The, the very people that put up roadblocks from, uh, on the uh, attack against the terrorists under Clinton are still there. And uh, they still constitute a uh, almost like a, a moat between the people with information and the people who should hear the information. So when you're talking to these Justice Department people and folks in Congress trying to give them all this information, what do they say to you? They say, oh, my, that's wonderful. Yeah, we'll, we'll get right back to you. I have never got a call back. When I was on a, a radio program out east, out in Pittsburgh, and I just made, I, I hinted at this. I just hinted that the FBI was sitting on information when they should have been sharing it with others, and as a result, there was a breakdown in... Uh, in um, intelligence. The next morning, I got a call from the office of the Speaker of the House, uh, who happens to be an Illinois Republican. Hastert. Hastert, right. And uh, they said, we understand. They hadn't heard the show, but they, under they said, we understand you've got some information, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I yes, I do. I would really like to share it with somebody. I have at least two and maybe three witnesses that should be subpoenaed to come out there and testify in executive session and tell you what I was talking about. 
Okay, we'll get back to you. That never heard again. A couple of days later, I got a call from the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee. We hear that you've got information, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I have information, and I'd be perfectly willing to bring it out to you, or I'd be perfectly willing to uh, have my witnesses go in there and testify, but they have to be subpoenaed. Okay, we'll get back to you. That was last week. I still haven't heard a word. I, I, you know, I talk to people like you who are in the, uh, in the media, people who are really well aware of what's going on, and they cannot believe that this can happen. Strangely enough, the one person, the, the one people that I haven't heard from is the FBI intelligence people. Of course, if I did hear from them, I wouldn't talk to them anyhow now, because they're totally incompetent. They got their funding tripled after the sure. first— Sure. Uh, Boy, that's great. They can all get a raise, and they can all sit around and tell everybody that their informants tell them this and informants tell them that. I'm still trying. I'm still trying, and I'm still trying to get some somebody to listen to me out there and listen to my witnesses and to, to at least take the material. You know, Dana Davis had the same stuff she showed me. She walked into the FBI in Oklahoma City shortly after the bombing and said, here, I have all this material. It may be of some assistance to you. And they said, we don't want it. They refused to even take it. Just like Sedan trying to give us the names of al-Qaeda and arrest bin exactly. Laden. Exactly. And they said, we don't want to do that. Well, then I think it, you're an investigator. You're a prosecutor, Mr. Shippers. You prosecuted the president of the United States, successfully got the indictment, but not— uh, Prosecuted the outfit here in Chicago for five years. So you know, you can see the motive. I see more intelligence funding. I see the cashless society with the biometrics. I see an expanded U.N. I see NATO planes patrolling our skies. Right. Uh, U.N. General McKenzie on Nightline uh, the 19th, the week after the attack, eight days after the attack, saying we need U.N. troops on our borders. I see global government being empowered and uh, a takeover of the Middle East and Central Asia uh, by the West. I mean, I, I see great dividends for them by allowing this to happen. So I hope to God you're wrong. I, I do. but uh, And I, I can't fight with you or argue with you on it because it does seem to be heading that way. For I trying to protect their country, the heroes get crucified. The heroes get crucified, and the bureaucrats sit out there and tell each other what a great job they're doing until another city blows up. And then they say, we need more tools. They have all the tools in the world. They could have found the money years ago if they had just listened. We've got to go public because we tried to do it the right way. We tried to do it by going to the people in whom you would normally repose your confidence and trust. It didn't work. Nobody cares. Well, we know this. The bureaucrats are going to get even more funding now. You want more evidence of prior knowledge? The October 24, 2001 Associated Press reported that Ari Fleischner in a White House press briefing admitted that George Bush and much of his cabinet were already on Cipro on September 11th, three and a half weeks before the first traces of it popped up in Boca Raton, Florida. This is a whole other section. We can make a whole other film on it, but it was actually proven that the anthrax was sent from Fort Detrick, Maryland, a U.S. weapons lab, again, to create fear. Another smoking gun. It never ends. I know the information in this documentary film is extremely painful, but the facts are the facts. Bush signed a document blocking the FBI and defense intelligence from stopping Al-Qaeda. They're actually suing him over it now. And realize that it's Democrats as well. The New World Order controls things at the top, and if we don't hold government responsible, they're going to use this terror to get more control over our lives. Now President Bush is seeking to restrict Capitol Hill probes. He had Dick Cheney call six separate congressional committees and threaten them, telling them not to investigate September 11th. And of course, the president has also activated the secret government. For the first time in history, FEMA command bunkers are brimming with National Security Agency personnel. And on top of it, Congress wasn't even advised. Neither the Senate leader nor the Speaker of the House were even told, despite the fact that they are the direct line of ascension in the chain of power. Why is it the president including elected officials in the continuity of government program? Back in 1999, there was a rising young star in Russia. He just stepped down as the head of the KGB, the new FSB, Vladimir Putin. He was Boris Yeltsin's top deputy. But how was he going to get into office when the polls showed the people didn't want him? Simple. 
he was caught blowing up three separate apartment buildings. That is, members of the FSB were with explosives. Moscow police actually arrested them. Now in 2002, members of the FSB, the Federal Security Bureau, have gone public with the information, as well as explosives experts and Vladimir Putin's best buddy, Boris Berovsky. They seized his media empire when he reported the facts. Again, Moscow police back in 1999 actually caught members of the FSB planting the bombs in a fourth building to create fear throughout the population. Now other top government officials have gone public saying that they knew the government was actually preparing to bomb buildings in 1999 as a pretext for control. And now they're actually seizing the videotape that proves it when Russian journalists as well as Russian politicians try to bring the film back into the country. So, carrying one of them terrorist manuals, are we? It's Ashcroft standing over Uncle Sam reading a book that says the Bill of Rights. Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? You're about to see the evidence. It's actually the facts. They're teaching police that if you read the Bill of Rights, you're with the terrorist. What has America come to? We're becoming more and more Sovietized every single day, and our, our new gracious homeland leader is George W. Bush. It's a sick joke. Who really stands to gain from this terrorism? The evidence is clear. The forces of the New World Order. Now let's talk about terrorism. Let's talk now about terrorism and about those who see violence against innocent civilians as a legitimate means, in their view, to achieve their ends. This new law that I signed today will allow surveillance of all communications used by terrorists, including emails, the Internet, and cell phones. Oh, the answer is yes. It's a war we have to win if we're going to protect the people of this country. I think the real issue is what do we sacrifice, what do we give up in the process? So there is going to be a continuing trade-off between security and liberty and freedom uh, going forward in the 21st century. Security is having this discussion right now with the political leaders. And we're probably going to be asked to do some things that uh, many people might not like because uh, it's going to call into question uh, some of the freedoms that we have had. Politics of terror. In the 20th and 21st century, inspection of any major terrorist event reveals that it is actually governments financing terrorist organizations to get a desired political outcome to condition their population to accept higher levels of control. You've seen Hitler, Stalin, Mao, you've seen them all do it throughout the 20th century. And now in the 21st century, they're telling us it's going to be the century of terror and the century of a new world order. Look at the U.S. government. They tell us to give up our rights while our borders stay wide open, while tens of millions of people pour across our borders, come in through our ports, and land on airplanes. They have the nerve to tell American citizens that we must accept a national ID card in the name of safety. Use some common sense. The government tells us to leave the borders open even after September 11th and then treats us like slaves? Doesn't make any sense unless you're a slave master. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you have been declared the terrorist. You're looking at an FBI flyer, and they've gone out nationwide, where the FBI actually states that Christians, conservatives, gun owners are part of terrorist organizations. Defenders of the U.S. Constitution are listed as terrorists. If police encounter them, call the FBI anti-terrorism hotline immediately. Even defenders of the U.S. Constitution, people that make numerous references to the U.S. Constitution. Wait a minute, I thought police swore an oath to protect protect and defend the Constitution, not in the new America, not with an America with a big fat K. Face the facts, America. You are the terrorist. Abby Newman claims the checkpoint was unconstitutional. State police say the stop was legal and Newman took it too far when she assaulted them. You can take a look at the video from the trooper's car taken here from the website Infowars.com and judge for yourself. Notice that the media wouldn't show a full screen so no one could tell what was actually happening. We'll show you what really happened. I need to know who you are. No, you don't. Yes, ma'am, I, I do. I'm not speeding. I am not intoxicated. I have given you no reason to stop me, and this irritates me. And I would be very happy to go into town and talk to the supervisor. Sir, you cannot. You cannot. This is my Step out of the vehicle. No, sir. You cannot reach into this vehicle. Sure, I can. You cannot. I got to know who you are. The, you do not. I, I must know who you are before you can go down the road. I have not broken any laws. I know. I have not accused you of breaking any laws, ma'am. You ma just reached in my vehicle and opened this door. And are I, I have no idea who you are.
The officer admits she's done nothing wrong, but she still must present her papers, all part of being guilty until proven innocent. I need to know who you are. Do you have a driver's license? You just proved to me you don't have probable cause because you don't avoid it. Okay, shut your ignition off for me. Pardon me? Turn your car off for me. Why do I have to turn off? Because I'm asking you to turn my car off. You are violating my United States constitutional rights. Any laws that go contrary to the United States Constitution are null and void, and I do not have to submit to them. I am not intoxicated. You have already stated you don't know who I am, so therefore... Uh, uh, I that's the whole point. I, I don't, don't know who you are. I have told you who I am. Okay, this is an approved checking detail site. Are you going to tell me who you are? No, sir. You're not going to tell me who you, you are? You have not charged me with anything. You have not told me I've well, done anything wrong, and I do not owe you that, sir. Because I don't serve you, you serve me. Okay. Because when you take one, you take another, you take another, and before all, you know it, we can't go anywhere without our papers, and that's what this is. May I see your papers, please? You can't travel down this road, ma'am, unless I show you show me your papers, please. You've already told me that the stickers are in order. I wasn't traveling in undue speed. I've done nothing wrong, and this is absolutely wrong. Don't reach inside my vehicle. I'm going to place you under arrest for obstruction of justice. What am I obstructing, sir? Sir! Step out of the car for me. Step out you of the car for me. You are physically forcing step, me step out. out of the car no, for sir, don't you touch any of my personal belongings in this car. You're right. Recorded this conversation. That's yes, I did. Resisting arrest. It is not a song. I get the car. Don't you take one single item out of my vehicle, sir? I'm not fighting you. You're under arrest for resisting arrest, obstruction of justice, and assault on a police officer. I did not assault you. Think about our priorities in America. At a warrantless Fourth Amendment violating checkpoint, they pull over a housewife with no criminal records. When she simply doesn't want to get out of her car, they grab her and charge her with assaulting them. Let's take a closer look and you can judge for yourself what this thought criminal has done. Sir! Step out of the car for me. Step out you of the car for me. You are physically forcing step, me step out. out of the car no, sir, don't you touch any of my personal belongings in this car. You're right, I've recorded this conversation. That's yes, I did. Resisting arrest. It is not assault. I get the car. Don't take one thing. You have the right to remain vehicle. silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in court. You have a right to speak to an attorney and have him present while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire an attorney, one will be appointed to represent you without any cost to you before any questions if you desire one. Do you understand those rights as they've been read to you? Do you understand your rights as they've been read to you? They're not concerned with our borders being wide open. The tens of millions of containers coming in each year that aren't even searched. No, they're worried about a woman on the side of the road and what she's reading, what she's thinking, what she's doing. This is the first generation thought police right here in the United States. This type of activity is totally un-American. These officers should be ashamed of themselves. Oh, I want to see what their name is. Strategies of submarine warfare. Hidden agenda. Called us Man, she's into this weird crap. Power plays, ruthless.com, the bear and the dragon, Patriot Games. Here's where things really get interesting as they begin to dig through her car and find what they consider subversive material. Well, I just will get a record started. Yeah. You don't ask her, you just won't get the next one. I won't get the next one. She's invoked her right to remain silent, even though she don't believe in our laws. Even though she don't believe in our laws, no trooper, it's you that don't know our laws. You're the one that's overthrowing our Constitution, our Bill of Rights. Our country was founded on people not being stopped like criminals, like peasants are being searched. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall be issued but upon probable cause. You wouldn't believe all the paraphernalia in here. I mean, look at this clipboard right here. Now. Comment upon voluntary nature of Social Security. It's a whole riot act on why you not you don't have to have a Social Security card to pay in the Social she Security. She's just anti-government, yeah. Uh, she apparently belongs to some kind of a uh, clan or something. Militant group. Yeah. It's uh, like Dixon Land Law Journal Constitution Society. I mean, all kind of compulsory production of, of documents. 
anti-government, a member of the Klan for knowing our constitutional rights, for being a member of the Constitutional Society, the FBI training of our police has really paid off. I mean, this is... She's definitely studied on it, hasn't she? I'm telling you what is the truth. I, I wonder if I can keep that for any reason. Well, is it evidence of a crime? I, I, you know, if, I, if it relates know. back to her obstruction of justice, I would say yes. I mean, I think obstruction of justice is... That would be the appropriate charge. Good. Yeah. And, and that relates to it. That's why she did it. I mean, it may actually... She may be the one that would want to bring it to court. I don't know. I, I don't know either. I mean, yeah. it, it'd probably be fine reading, but I, I'm not sure if I can seize it or not. Yeah. I, know I, don't, I don't know that this is illegal. Uh, exactly. I, mean, I, you know, I think she can read that all she wants to. I think she can read it all she wants to. Now, this is, if they've actually outlawed that, that is. And I think they have. Abby Newman was vindicated by a jury of her peers and found not guilty of assault on a royal police officer and of resisting arrest. But they still tried to get her for simply invoking her constitutional rights. You heard them digging through her goods. Oh, look at pocket constitution. What are we going to do? And then look at this poor guy. This is one of my listeners. They pulled him over. The SWAT team attacked him. He was unarmed. They released a police dog on him and then held up two jumper cables on the news and said, look, pipe bombs. Of course, a month later, they admitted that all the charges were false, but that didn't stop them from having a little fun, a little manhunt. There's nothing like it here in the new Rome. America, it's time to wake up to what's happening. We're being treated like animals. Farrell Montgomery, one of my radio listeners, just pulled over, attacked for no reason, shot with two taser guns, and a dog attacked him. And then here's the Register Herald, big newspaper in West Virginia. Christians a hate group. They found out the FBI and law enforcement schools across the state, and it's going on around the country, are teaching them that Christians, period, are hate criminals, are part of a terrorist group if they believe in a second coming of Christ. And all this comes right out of the Project Megiddo report, where they list homeschoolers, gun owners, anybody that cares about freedom, anyone that believes in Jesus Christ, anyone that believes in a second coming. Again, where did the First Amendment go? Anyone that discusses a new world order conspiracy theory. Well, you've heard world leaders say a new world order throughout this documentary. Anyone that talks about a new world order takeover. The evidence is clear. If you resist the new world order takeover, you're being demonized as a hate criminal. Look, it lists homeschoolers as terrorists. Remember, if you say new world order, you're a terrorist. It is a big idea, a new world order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. The President George Bush has talked time and time again about a new world order. And this is the best chance to begin to establish the new world order. One of my listeners in Missouri, a patriotic firefighter, sent us this footage of a FEMA commando demonizing the founding fathers and Christians to a group of police and firefighters. What are Christians and patriots? The new Jews? You're damn right, because think about the Christians, okay? Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You no. Know, what did they do? They took your head off. They beheaded you if you didn't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, this is reality. Yeah, they're terrorists. But the bottom line is, to them, they are not. Now, why is that important to understand? Because they are as committed to their cause and to their way of life as you are yours. And they see you as being wrong. That's very difficult. When people are passionate about what they believe in, they become a very difficult enemy to be. Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> Who? Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. You mean Thomas Jefferson? Oh, yeah. You mean uh, George Washington? Oh, yeah. Paul Revere? Yeah. Yeah. These guys right here, let me ask you something. Did they try to scare people? Oh, yeah. They tried to intimidate the British. Did they try to, did they use acts of violence? Your Founding Fathers, my Founding Fathers, were involved in acts of terrorism against British officials because they systematically had British officials assassinated. Assassinated. 
The guys who we call our founding fathers, George Washington, Mr. Honest, who cut down a cherry tree and admitted it, is the same guy who signed death orders, if you will, on members of the British government, the British crown, who they wanted to eliminate because politically they had influence in certain pockets of the United States, at that time the 13 colonies, and they wanted to divide and conquer. They may get a whole lot of civilians, and hey, let's, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? If they killed 10,000 civilians tomorrow with a biological agent, that's too bad for them. Yeah, so what if they killed 10,000 civilians? You know how these patriots are. They're always killing civilians. So what? We've just got to take care of ourselves. Talk about demonization. If anybody's going to kill 10,000 civilians, it's the feds. All the evidence shows it's the feds killing people. 3,000 plus at the World Trade Center and Pentagon. Here's Bush signing the USA Patriot Act that literally eviscerated the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Section 213 delays warrants. It means they can sneak in your house for any reason, take whatever they want, and never even tell you they were there. But you're like, oh, that's okay. There's a sunset clause. Well, if you look at that subsection, all of the key areas that violate your constitutional rights, there are no sunset provisions. Out of 1,016 sections, 802 has to be the most frightening. You see, the definition of domestic terrorism is anyone that is involved in acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state. Under their definition, jaywalking is now a terrorist action. This is an absolute outrage. The people that pass this legislation, in truth, are the real terrorists, the real criminals engaging in sedition against our constitutional republic. Congressman Ron Paul said that none of the Congress was allowed to even read the bill and threatened by the White House that they wouldn't be patriots if they didn't sign it. He said the founding fathers revolted over much lighter forms of tyranny. Unfortunately, we may not always be able to tell you why that agent or agents are knocking on your door. Is there a chance that some of your civil liberties may slip while we guarantee the security of this country? Maybe. Maybe. Slimeball FBI agents like Steven Steinhauser are all over the country in huge meeting halls telling people they've got to give up their liberty for security. Now we're seeing urban warfare teams pop up in major cities and small towns alike. They like you to believe that this is some new phenomenon that they have to do since September 11th. We're about to go into the evidence of what's been going on in the last decade here in the United States. How they were training the cadres, the groups of officers, to go out and train the mass of troops for a total militarized takeover of the United States of America in the name of protecting the population from enemy terrorists. In truth, the military has been training to attack the American population. Back in 1999, Texas got hit by six black helicopter raids, police stations on fire, military checkpoints. Mayors throwing them out of their cities. Police chiefs going public. We had Czechoslovakian troops running around firing automatic weapons. And this was not a drill. This was to condition the public, to acclimate them to accept the military with foreign troops working with our local police. You're witnessing actual footage of Delta Force troops. U.S. Special Forces with Czechoslovakian troops running around in downtown Kingsville, setting fire to local structures. I thought black helicopters didn't exist. From Fort Bragg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Delta Force? Yeah. Looking out your window and seeing unmarked helicopters and, and troops dressed in ninja black suits with assault rifles, it's kind of spooky. But that's the point of the operation. It's to train the public, the police, and the military that all of this is okay. The military can engage the population. Now, here's the mayor of Port Aransas, and he was extremely upset. Then we'll talk to a police chief of San Antonio. Nobody wants to get in their business, but we ought to be able to answer questions, especially when they're, you know, flying at dangerously low levels and, and alerting the citizenry. The chief of police of San Antonio refused for two years to let Delta Force take over the city. When he refused, they just did it anyway. They don't care about local authorities. Approached me and get me to change my mind. Well then, when we said no, then some elected officials were contacted to bring pressure to bear. Uh, and then uh, offers were made to give money, cash money, to elected officials' charities if they could get us to change our minds. I mean, uh, you know, as one of my deputy chiefs said, in some circles that's called bribery uh, in and around the San Antonio area, but we're not doing them here. 
Next day, I'm still getting contacted by various officials. I mean, they never would say take no for an answer. So they weren't respecting your jurisdiction? They were not respecting our jurisdiction. Uh, I don't think they respected our decision uh, to go into predominantly uh, minority areas of the city where we had vacant warehouses and buildings and try to do those types of exercises in those locations what in the middle of, of the night. Oh, I'm sorry, middle of the night? In the middle of the night. Um, you know, sometime between 9 p.m. and midnight. You know, I mean, it, pe people become frightened. And we, we drew a lot of our decision-making on experiences that had happened in a lot of other cities. Um, we were very concerned with some things that have happened over there, and we didn't get any real good, clear answers. So they were uh, being uh, secretive about it? Very secretive. Um, we're just curious about uh, Army Special Operations uh, from Fort Bragg coming here, Delta Force. Uh -huh. And we'd like uh, just uh, basically to ask some questions about... Uh, was the public informed uh, beforehand? Uh, are y'all aware of the Tenth Amendment and posse comitatus and things like that? No, I, I'm probably not aware of the Tenth Amendment, but I, 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 uh, I made the decision not to inform the public. He made the decision not to warn the public or the emergency managers or the police when eight black helicopters slammed into the town. Here's the chief of police in Alice admitting foreign troops. Government is training other so-called friendly countries, or they are training friendly countries, and uh, I'm not at liberty to give you their names, but uh, I know that they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, they were they were there in Alice, or you know, a couple weeks ago. They were so present, yes. Mm -hmm. The foreign troops were there. Now the NATO aircraft are in our skies. And they get to burn out police stations three days after the police pull out. It had to be a proper spectacle for the old folks' home across the street. Foreign troops burning out police stations. But that's okay because it's just for fighting foreign enemies. Well, here's actual footage from Fort Hood, Texas, as the BATF, the gun confiscators, train with the Green Berets for an assault on the Waco compound, the wooden church full of men, women, and children, violating every canon of a free society. The military with the state police and the BATF assaulted the Branch Davidians. And then, of course, on April 19th, they actually burned the structure down full of men, women, and children. The training, the assaults on the population have been going on for over a decade here in the United States, and the death toll is climbing. What's happened to our special forces? What type of cowards have they been twisted into that they go out and attack American citizens, wooden churches full of men, women, and children, and then slough it off as if, oh, well, they're just a bunch of cult members? Whatever happened to live and let live? And whatever happened to the federal law barring troops from assaulting civilians? Whatever happened to the 1878 law, posse commentatus? Unfortunately, it was flushed down the toilet a long time ago. Well, here we are in Northern California in Oakland, and uh, the Marines have come in for Operation Urban Warrior, what should be deemed Operation Desensitization of the Population. And they have their role players, they have their fake camps set up, you name it. We're going to take you in and show you what's happening. Attention, attention, attention. American forces are here to help. Remain calm. We will not tolerate civil disobedience. Attention, attention, attention. American forces are here to help. Please remain calm. We will not tolerate civil disobedience. I've made two documentary films about the police state and been to dozens of these military training operations where they hire hundreds of role players to beg and scream, we're Americans, please don't put us in camps, don't take our guns. Technologies are what makes you nauseous. In the past, in a situation like that, she might have been shot. In the future, we want to give our Marines non-lethal options where they can say, no, she's not armed, 
maybe threatening, but I don't want to kill her, or I don't want to kill him or them. Use your uh, your sound wave rifle, I guess you could call it, and uh, down they go. Yeah, him in prison, huh? Now you're gonna see an execution. <laughs> Okay, the, these guys have plastic handcuffs available. Well, I think terrorism is being practiced on the residents of the city of Oakland because many of the uh, retired, in fact, retired teachers, retired military people have uh, informed me that uh, they, they understand what's going on and it's not anything that relates to humanitarian training whatsoever. This is a psychological, as we in the research community say, this is a psyops. They're preparing people for what is coming, not what is being presented today. So you're saying they're preparing people to accept it with incrementalism? That is correct, like the old frog example. You know, you put the frog in the water and you just gradually continue to raise the heat on the water until the frog is cooked. And that's the way it works. Of course, that was California in 99. By 2000, they were actually arresting people in Swansboro, North Carolina. And they called it training. Patrolling, taking over the city council, taking over the public buildings, running checkpoints, searching people's cars, taking them to jail, confiscating firearms, and it was in the newspaper. Oh, wow, the Marines are out on the road just helping us because the government said it wasn't a question of if, but when the next terrorist attack was coming in. We were going to have to give up our liberties for security. Remember what the FBI agent said? Are you going to have to give up your rights? Maybe, maybe. Preparing the cadres, searching people's cars, taking people to jail. Is this Russia? Is this Mexico? No, it's the new America. Well, I'm glad the Marines are learning how to do their police work, and, well, here's two of the troublemakers now that they've apprehended. Hmm. We showed you California in 99, and, of course, what was happening in North Carolina in 2000 in Swansboro. This is Hebron, Maryland, back in 1998, where they had the children running around in these little white T-shirts, and they were publicly training them to go around and find out where the gun owners were. We interviewed the commander of the Marines, and he admitted they were doing house-to-house -house searches with volunteers for weapon sweeps. When we talked to the Marines on the ground, they admitted that this was for a domestic takeover to fight domestic insurgents patrolling America, taking over the city council, taking over the town hall, working with the local police, total acclamation, total integration, total downtown Moscow, USA. And of course, they had an obsession with the youth. Large gangs of young children roving around day and night with the police and the Marines looking for the insurgents. And of course, there were hundreds of them marching around in plain clothes. America needs a secret police, don't we? Understand, this goes against the very grain of what it is to live in the United States. And I'm not against our police or our military. Think tanks, psychological warfare, psyops experts have created a program of incrementalism in the last decade that has brought us to this point in America. And now since September 11th, they have their pretext, their excuse to roll the troops out in mass. They've announced it in the Washington Post. Uh, United States Army, 365 plus thousand of them to patrol our highways. Imagine Marines in your backyard, in your front yard, walking down your streets in the middle of the night. Well, you're a patriot, aren't you? 
Well, I certainly am, but this is a deadly, dangerous precedent that's being set. They're brainwashing our military. Now, if they had nothing to hide, I'm a little confused by their actions. The police began to get more and more aggressive as the night wore on, simply because this average Joe Q citizen was trying to catch some videotape of the bizarre activities. Oh, nothing. I just said I didn't have it on then anyway. I, I was talking to you. I didn't have it on. How you doing? Good evening. What's that? It's a good evening. How you doing, that, sir? Very good. Yourself? Hey. How you doing? Not bad. Were you the same guy with you earlier? Here's an article from February 2002 as we make this documentary. Marines are occupying multiple cities in the continental United States. And yes, they're engaging in strategic deception against the population. Jenny Holbert, the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory spokesperson, told the public that, oh, this is the first time we've done something like this. It's very unusual. We've never been in an American city. We've never done urban warfare training in an American city before. Oh no, just a couple hundred times. <laughs> With the local police, again, searching houses, searching cars, doing a mock takeover. The Army War College called for foreign troops to occupy the United States back in 1999. And now George Bush has actually done it. That's an article from the CBC. They want hundreds of thousands of foreign UN troops on our streets. You're not for the terrorist, are you? And they want 350 plus thousand US troops to quote, patrol the US, to patrol our highways, our neighborhoods, our communities in total violation of posse commentatus. They admit that they're actually scrapping the law prohibiting troops. Not that it even matters, they're already militarizing our police. Our team was in Swansboro, North Carolina back in 2000. In February of 2002, two special forces trainees were killed by a sheriff's deputy. You ask why? They were trying to disarm him. They were trying to take over local law enforcement. This is the new type of training that our military are being given to overthrow the civilian government, the elected government, right here in the United States. And shockingly enough, there were actually two cases of this in the same week in North Carolina where they were being trained to overthrow the civilian government. Over to your right also! This looks like a gaggle, Mr. Wright. Get these lines Let's straight go! Out. Straighten it out! Just to your right! Is your group ready? Sir, yes, sir! Sir, group prepared and ready. Go, sir! Every day in America, militarized SWAT teams kill innocent people, and they're rarely held accountable. More often, they kill their own officers, and still they're not held accountable. What's happening in America? How do they become so militarized? We interviewed a former Marine Corps officer who in 1989, while he was in the Marine Corps, was serving search warrants on American citizens' homes and businesses. To start at the beginning for us, uh, a little bit about your past, uh, how you first got involved in the military. Uh, and some of the things you did, and then later in life, some of the questions that you started raising yourself uh, after you've been a police officer. Okay. Uh, I started out, I joined the Marines, uh, tested real high on the ASVAB, which is the Armed Forces Vocational Aptitude Battery. Did real well in that, and I was an MP5800 military police. Uh, from that, I was sent over to various duty stations. I still had an interest in civilian law enforcement, so I was able to take part in joint military police and civilian police exercises. Uh, we've seen the urban warfare training all across the country, the, the black helicopters, the special forces uh, in cities, <clears throat> and it seems like it's been ratcheted up in the last five years from just basic training to actual live fire in city streets. Uh, what type of relationship did you have with law enforcement when you were in the Marine Corps? Very cohesive a lot of interaction. Uh, 1988 and 1989, like I told prior, I helped assist in three search warrants. A lot of uh, entry team operations, giving civilian law enforcement advice and critiquing how they're doing that to <clears throat> raid such as crack houses or 
supposed terrorist organizations as far as multiple entry points of a home, whether it be through the roof, the windows, and front door, or a combination of all at the same time. So you were actively, as a member of the United States Marine Corps active duty, out with civilian law enforcement serving search warrants to homes? That's correct. Right. There weren't missions that were called exercises, but it was actual with real what we call combatants, real life. It was the real deal, helping execute search warrants. Late 80s, um, I've actually been on point with an MP5, and I was, I was not in a police uniform. I had a police flak vest on and a police jacket and black BDUs. <clears throat> and these were obviously drug dealers? One, maybe. What were the other raids concerning? Um, pawn shop owners. One of them was a pawn shop owner, and the other was for um, a joint working with uh, ATF. As a member of the Marine Corps, David, you're telling us you raided a civilian uh, business with the BATF going after guns? It was the business owner's home. Oh, the business owner's home. The homes were civilian homes and some upper middle class to white collar homes. Uh, one was a warehouse facility. Later on in life, you got out of the Marine Corps, you got into law enforcement. Is that when you started asking questions once you learned more about the civilian role? Towards, towards my end in the law enforcement, when I started getting discouraged with it, yes. That's when I started quitting. But when you're younger and you're trying to achieve and you're you know, you got all the fancy jewelry on and all the badge and the car with all the nice decals and lights and, you know, you, you're disillusioned by a lot of different things once reality is. And just the way law enforcement has changed a lot, it's changing a lot. How has it changed? Uh, how people perceive law enforcement is more of an occupying army than somebody that's there to be part of that community and help that community. Like I said before, in prior interview that you know before people knew the law enforcement officer that patrolled their neighborhood or could go down to the city police department and ask for help where now it's more of a you're you're making you're making trouble for yourself by going to report a crime or just the perception that people have of law enforcement now don't get me wrong there's some great cops out there some of the best and they're still there doing the job and there's no one comes up there doing the job but for the most part it's treated like a occupying army you're seeing a lot more of the uh, the training of putting distance between yourself and the people you're trying to protect. The new rules of engagement, an us against them mentality. Peace officers are defenders of the people. You bring them a hot cup of coffee, a slice of pie, they help you get the cat out of the tree. That was the old days before they became the military and then merged with the military. That's before they started patrolling our streets and running our country. That's before the second amendment was under attack and frankly almost gone. That was before the government started shipping in the heroin and the cocaine to create the societal crises. That was before black helicopter raids in late 2001 on St. Louis. Don't believe us? Call somebody who lives in St. Louis. Of course, then there's the Department of the Army document they gave us back in 99 on the side of the highway at a military checkpoint where they say, give us a call, local police departments. We'll serve search warrants on your citizens' homes. We'll shoot them. Our response area is in 77 counties. We're responsible for 77 counties here in, in Texas. Oh, really? So if a local PD needs support, they'll call us. You're saying you're saying there's some people here that we're not allowed to film. Right. There's some people here that we would ask that, uh, well, hang on for a second. Why, why would you want that on camera? Well, because we want to expose the secret police. We want to expose how you're working with the military, how you're running checkpoints on I-35 in Central Texas. And it's going on in Iowa. It's going on in Tennessee. The gun confiscations, the SWAT team raids, the fake attacks like this one. On Saturday, May 12th, at approximately 8.50, an explosive device went off in the Bell County Annex in the 500 block of East 2nd Street in Melbourne. The Belton Police Department responded to that, as well as the Belton Fire Department and the Belton EMS. The Belton Police Department is currently investigating the cause of the explosion. The explosion took place on the east end of the building, caused, causing several casualties and injuries. The Police Department has secured the scene 
and requested assistance from the Fort Hood Delta team in a psychological warfare program against the people of Central Texas. The whole attack was fake, but they told the public it was real. Again, all part of merging the military and the police. That's my truck right there. That's good. Go back over there, get clearance to go back through. Did, uh, were you at this scene in Temple? No, Mike was. I was. Mike was. Yeah. So he put me on the internet. No, I didn't. Who put me on the internet? Well, we put know, it on. Do you have a uh, problem with that? Yes, I do. Well, it's not me because I don't. We, I don't do anything. We put it on uh, TV. Okay. And then yeah, it's been on TV. Okay, because there were pictures on, on the internet, and somebody put them on there without my permission. My, you know. So my you got to contact whoever did it. Okay. Yeah, but that's news. But you're public. You're yeah, public. Yeah, it's we, news we, gathering. We, yeah, once, once you're in public. Once you're in public, yeah. when, I could turn the camera on right now and say, "Hey, I'm gonna put you on TV." The scary part was, just for asking questions, the police and military were angry at us. We were bad. We weren't going along with creating hysteria. 20 EMS workers have been, or rather uh, DPS workers, have gone on ambulances to area hospitals. Some of them have been treated and released now. The rest are in stable condition. EMS tells us another five drove themselves to area hospitals, and then they checked out about 161 people here on the scene. In 2000 alone in Austin, Texas, there were eight separate fake bio attacks. They even had a fake nuclear spill and shut down I-35 and called out the National Guard. A couple weeks later, they quietly announced, oh, it was just a drill. But you should have seen the psychosomatic response of the people. Suddenly, hospitals would be jam-packed. The population was buying it. Awesome. We're going to fight the new world order. Hello, Vaughn SS. <laughs> Get it on. I got it. Get the search lines. Yeah, roll, my friend. Yeah, ball. We all thought this couldn't happen here. It was only Russia or Nazi Germany. But incrementally, they trained us to accept it. Now we have to learn to say no and get in their face. We have dignity. We're human beings. Government's taken over in a parasitic fashion. Did you ever think you'd see the government talking about torture and lauding the virtues of it? Well, now it's actually happening in hundreds of publications. And if you're not for torture, you're with Al-Qaeda. Why, even phony liberals like Alan Dershowitz have been publicly peddling it, telling us it's time for us to reassess our laws and accept torture. But for the terrorists, of course. But the evidence shows that we are now the terrorists. They talk about using cattle prods and rubber hoses on people. And who's going to do the torturing? FEMA, the Ministry of Love. And that's the Federal Emergency Management Administration. All those years we warned people about FEMA. You can read the federal documents. Roundup plans, concentration camps, people laughed at us. Then came Seattle. They put 500 of the peaceful demonstrators in a FEMA camp, the Sandpoint FEMA camp. We woke up one morning in Austin, Texas, and found a concentration camp on our own backyard. How, uh, how did they fix it up? Uh, well, uh, Travis County came out here and uh, with uh, some inmates... And they cleaned it all up, swept it, uh, pulled weeds, and then they got inside and um, reinforced the um, well, um, the uh, doors and stuff, with uh, bars and stuff. Did you hear about the chains in the floor with the bolts? No, I sure haven't. They announced it on the news. They threw it in our face. The U.S. Army, FEMA, out of an old 747 hangar, bolts and chains in the floor, troops marching around, armored vehicles, porta potties, stacks of cods. Long before the September 11th attack, they were going to take good care of us. But of course, after the attack, even the Washington Times reported George Bush enacted 500 dormant legal clauses, provisions allowing censorship and martial law, force roundups. Then they have the model state's health law where they're allowed to put us in sports stadiums or aircraft hangars and, quote, shoot old women if ordered to do so. The Model State Emergency Health Powers Act. Most of the 50 states are now passing it as we make this film. 
And it is a Adolf Hitler wish list. They talk about how to deal with the millions of dead bodies, how they're going to round us up, how to herd us into compact cities, how to use slave labor at the different federal camps, and how they've already been doing it uh, since 1989 at 12 different army bases. They just got done classifying that, by the way. You can go to the Army's website and read about it. You see, a lot of things have been going on in the country you didn't hear about. They were busy building FEMA camps and getting you ready to go into them. Then they've got bills like H.R. 2977, where they talk about different mind control systems they have, different ultra-low frequency mind control devices that can make you become sick or even kill you or make you do what's required of you. 2977, an actual federal document, an actual federal bill admitting that they're spraying chemical and biological weapons on us through the use of something called chemical trails that they're adding to jet fuel, especially in military aircraft. And then if you go to law enforcement catalogs like Shomer Tech, the biggest law enforcement military catalog out there in the world, they have the sonic nausea system, the supersonic nausea system, where they brag that police have been using this for years to manipulate and stop political speeches. It can make a whole crowd get sick, and they can't even hear it. Then ABC News reported the Kokomo hum, an entire town of people becoming ill from the ultra-low frequency attack on a mass scale. Now let's see how they're indoctrinating our children. Soviet style. You can give information without having to give your name. If you guys have all the information that I need. You guys can get paid for good tips anywhere from up to $200. You'll sign this card, you'll get one of these membership cards. Now I have the responsibility of Taking care of my school and making sure no kind of crimes are going on during the hour. Drug dealers are selling drugs and nobody gets hurt. By giving them this program. You get millions of children into the police state system. You condition them to be members of the secret police. You destroy the very fabric of America and you pay them $200 every time they turn someone in, including members of their family. It's incredibly painful to see how far America slipped. They've got dozens of different names for these programs, but they're all the same. Wave, save, dare. It has nothing to do with drugs. Government ships the drugs in. That's public knowledge. It's about creating a whole generation of government snitches, of, of secret police, of East German Stasi. They give the children discount credit cards, toys, CD players sometimes thousands of dollars to turn their parents in for quote owning firearms. I've seen the handbooks when firearms aren't even illegal. When third row stand up, face me, walk to the door backwards real slow. More importantly, it's about training your children to be prisoners. They have ID cards to buy their lunches. Thumb scan in many cases to get their lunches. We'll cover that later. Men in black uniform point MP5 submachine guns, many times loaded at their heads, and load themselves in a drill onto a bus. But I know what you're thinking. Hey, we all saw what happened at Columbine. We've got to protect our children. We've got to put fences up. We've got to turn them into a prison. We've got to have them searched without warrants. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now come out in court documents, and SWAT team members were caught on tape admitting that they actually shot the children at Columbine. It's been confirmed that at least six of the 13 were killed by the SWAT teams. Drop the weapon! Drop the gun! Weapon. Sadistic predators across the nation get to enjoy abusing, traumatizing children as young as six years of age. Men in black uniforms yell and scream and cuss profanities at them that we've had to edit out here as they beg and cry and plead. They're then loaded on the buses and, yes, taken to a local jail. Drug around like filth, like garbage, like criminals. A whole generation learning how to be slaves, learning how to bow down and beg and put their hands behind their head when the ring race, the dark lords, appear. 54 children died in the year 2000 in high school football accidents. 52 died in school shootings. And many of them died at the hands of SWAT teams. Take Fort Worth, Texas, where cop of the year in a SWAT team drill at a school was shot in the head by one of his comrades. Again, these people are shooting their own officers in the head. Again, don't forget in Fort Worth, they shot their own officer in the head at a school. Just a few weeks ago in Detroit, they shot a kid in the face in one of these so-called drills. Situated on over 16,000 acres of farmland, 
Heartland encompasses Heartland Community Church, a non-denominational organization founded on the model given in Scripture of a New Testament church. Heartland is home to one of the finest Christian academies in the country. Covering grades K through 12, Heartland Christian Academy provides top quality instruction facilitated by the latest in educational technology. The Heartland Recovery Centers serve both women and girls and in separate facilities, men and boys. Heartland Christian School has an incredible track record for reforming troubled youth. That's why Child Protective Services swooped in and, and kidnapped 165 of them without a warrant and never even charged anybody and were later forced to release all the children. There's hours of horrible video as you see the children just filled with terror. I said, we're going to get away from this camera. We're going to do something. Yeah. Yeah, but we all got. Uh -huh. We're going to get on this. Just, just get the child. Okay. Everybody? Everybody that we load up. Okay. Yeah. We'll just we'll single file them out there, and they'll just everybody's that comes out. Get off her! That's child abuse! No, it's child abuse! You say that whenever they touch it, it's child abuse! That is child abuse! Get him off of her now! That's child abuse! Hey, Mr. Lightyear! Never made a delivery to your home before. I'm taking some personal days off, Ed. Usually I gotta track you down in some toxic vortex, a cosmic battlefield. Retinal scan okay? Ouch! What's that for? DNA sample. New policy. A lot of evil hologramic activity going on lately. If we were to show you all the evidence in children's cartoons and media of face scanning, thumb scanning, national ID cards, and overall police state, this film would be 10 hours long. Let's just look at the facts. D.C. has already now implemented a card that is held with the CIA and the National Security Agency for all children. Face scans, thumbprints, you name it. And if they want their school lunches, they have to thumb scan to get it. No thumb scan, no food training them for the cashless society and getting them into the database. Think about it. Thumb scanning in government schools to get food. But it's not just children that are being conditioned. Adults all across the land are thumb scanning to bank. And not just bank, to get their lunch too at Kroger and HEB food stores from Texas to New York. And now the feds have passed a law that all new cell phones starting in October 1st, 2001 have to have a satellite tracking grid so they know exactly where you're at for your safety, whatever happened to the Fourth Amendment. Then there's OnStar. The federal government is in talks with the states to force everyone to have an OnStar type tracking system in their car for tracking as well as taxation purposes. Private companies are racing ahead to implement this Big Brother system. $450 fines from rental car companies for going one mile over the speed limit. And that's if you pass the thumb scan to get your rental car. We saw all this coming back in 97 and I got arrested protesting it. The media is talking about thumb scanning to travel. You're working with the foreign banks and the military industrial complex. This is all their idea. Read the military war college from 1968. They planned this. And just because you lay around doesn't mean it's not true. Alex Jones is now in an Austin jail, and he'll face a... Disorderly conduct charge, which mysteriously disappeared off the books. They didn't want to create a court case where I could challenge them for violating my God-given rights. Now here's Dan Rather talking about what they have planned for you and your family in the new police state America. Nonviolent offenders who don't even have to be behind bars. They could be closely tracked by a global positioning satellite that can spot them down to a few feet. Electronic boundaries like those we impose on pets could be set up for these inmates, and surgically implanted electrodes could even shock them until they return to where they're supposed to be. One thing we could implant would be a subliminal implant. In other words, basically messages being typed into the uh, subconscious constantly. Do the right thing. Do what's required of you. Be a good citizen. Don't disobey the law. Well, this slug would love to make you do what's required of you and cram you in a supermax prison. Our prison population's jumped to 6.5 million in the last two years. Now they're talking about robots controlling us and implanting the entire population with microchips or your four Al-Qaeda. Oh, we're crazy. We're, we're making it up. They'd never peddle microchips, would they? <laughs> 
Something has to change, though. They have to find a better way to identify the bad guys, or the rest of us are going to stay home and watch the world go by on televisions. But we need some system for permanently identifying safe people. Most of us are never going to blow anything up, and there's got to be something better than one of these photo IDs, a tattoo somewhere, maybe. The Saudis used an American device to scan the eyes of travelers. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. If we don't do something, people are going to stop flying. If they stop flying, and I don't go to the Giants games, it means the bastards have won. Yeah, we're not going to let you in, buddy. We saw what you just implied. We're with Al-Qaeda if we don't take the microchip. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. Top CFR Lieutenant Diane Sawyer for eight minutes sat there in a sickening fashion with this poor, pathetic family as they discussed how they were all taking microchips because they believed in America and wanted to stop the terrorist. Ladies and gentlemen, this is something out of a science fiction horror movie. They're taking chips because they stand with the mother government. I'm living in Nazi Germany Twilight Zone. Now politicians are announcing that they want to get chipped. Strategic defense. Optical identification. Voice verification. Jason Taylor, defensive end, Miami Dolphins. Clearance granted. You're a star. You're a professional football player. You're getting scanned. It's not just children getting brainwashed on cartoons. It's everywhere. This is the prison grid, turning the whole world into a cashless control system. I have read the federal documents, the total plan to force us into these compact cities. You absolutely must resist the thumb scans, the face scans, the retina scans, cameras that can recognize you and scan your face against a billion faces in a single second. Everything, no food, no water, no houses, no jobs, no nothing without it. They're actually announcing it. They're going to put it in place. And you are the terrorist. You've already heard them say it. Gun owners, Christians, conservatives, libertarians, liberals, anybody that doesn't go along with global new world order tyranny will be watched, will be controlled, will be tracked. The New World Order gang has a reason they want to control you, and they've bragged about it. Now the Bilderberg Group and Reuters, which they own, have gone public that they actually groom our presidents, our prime ministers, that yes, they really are international bankers, yes, they are royal families, yes, they do run the central banks, and that we are the property of a global super state in Reuters they're throwing it in your face, which is owned by a Bilderberg Group member, like Prince Philip. Prince Philip in his own publication, if I was an animal, brags about how he would kill 80% of the population, how his great dream is to come back as a virus. Ladies and gentlemen, this is in your face. These psychos are creating a matrix-like control system and talking about killing you. From Ted Turner at the UN to Prince Philip, they're out of control and on a massive power trip. People like Ted Turner and Maurice Strong have actually been pushing writing the textbooks for a massive environmental movement control system to steal all of the private property. Using the phony environmental movement, they're ramming through their agenda. Remember, the environmental movement has nothing to do with saving the environment and everything to do with stealing property and empowering world government. We've lost our way. The Earth is a living organism. we got to praise our mother goddess. I produced a documentary film called America Destroyed by Design. We traveled 6,000 miles around America and witnessed the horror of the United Nations taking over our national parks and monuments. Now under the desertification treaty signed October 18th, 2000, 70% of the country is under United Nations jurisdiction. This is the map of what they plan to control in the next two years. 
You see, 90% of the country is already pristine, so most Americans don't realize how much has already been taken by the United Nations. The three maps you see on your screen are what they plan to get. All the areas in red, if you lay the three maps over each other, show that upwards of 90% of the country will be controlled by the United Nations. And way back in the mid-1990s, the United Nations Treaty, the Convention on Biodiversity, states that human beings are nothing more than cattle, chattel, and must be controlled by a centralized law enforcement police state, that property rights are not absolute, and that people are the problem, and that global tyrannical government is going to have to step in to save the earth. Talk about tyrants making excuses for their criminal activity. It then goes on to talk about chicken little debates about how there's going to be global warming and the sky is falling, and if they don't get rid of 80 plus percent of us, we're talking about 5 plus billion people, that the earth is going to die. Then the UN talks about how we must all be reduced to the level of peasants or there won't be enough resources to go around. Talk about a rationale for slavery. Then they brag about ancient societies using infanticide, human sacrifice, homicide and feuding, and other horrible practices as a way to control population and how it's good. The Burmese army killed 2,000 people and drove 30,000 from their homes to make way for a United Nations environmental sanctuary. Then they discuss how they can murder half the world's population by restricting fertilizers. This was written by psychotic murderers. The documents already talked about human sacrifice. Then they get into how ancient societies use the environment and considered it to be holy and how Christians cut down the sacred groves where they engage in their special rituals that help maintain and replenish nature. Then there are the mysterious Georgia Guidestones owned by Illuminati leaders that actually talks about reducing the world population by 80%. That number we heard from Prince Philip and Ted Turner so many times before. How they must maintain the population forcibly at 500 million. And now in recently declassified government documents in Australia, we learn that world famous microbiologists, Nobel Prize winners, were actually planning to release biological weapons to reduce an overpopulated world. The revelation is contained in top secret files declassified by the National Archives of Australia. I challenge everyone to read the Nightmare Kyoto Treaty. A total United Nations takeover of the world's energy supply. A huge taxing mechanism to control the populations of the planet Earth. And the science behind it? There is no global warming. We have a regular 12,000 year cycle with 100 year sub-cycles. Then they have their chicken little scenario of ozone thickness. Using fear to get control of the resources. Then they have their human waste reclamation centers. Their centralized, federalized, socialized healthcare systems. So they can cover up the mass poisoning of the entire population. Fluoride, a known deadly toxin that causes cancer, severe bone fractures, you name it, retardation of children. Talk to the Nobel laureates that have exposed it. It's being crammed into the water worldwide. The amount of solid scientific evidence that fluoride kills is now overwhelming. Those that oppose it are flat earthers, denying the facts of what's happening in our society. Aspartame, the taste that kills. To call aspartame a poison is doing it a favor. According to the scientists and brain surgeons I've interviewed, this is one of the biggest killers in the United States today. It's in over 9,000 foods. Everything from cancer viruses to squalene and mercury has been found in vaccines. The entire vaccine supply is contaminated. And what is the government doing? Mandating more and more injections of our children. Truth is stranger than fiction. Elites throughout history have always sought to control their peasants, control their serfs. And now the elite has almost unlimited technology they know that breakthroughs have already occurred that will allow them to have extended lives, perhaps eternal lives, with the help of the cybernetic interfaces. The globalists, and they talk about it in their own policy papers, are not about to allow you and your family to have access to this. They're going to herd you into the reservations. They're going to control you with the new advanced technologies that they're totally obsessed with. They're going to exterminate 80% of you, and then they are going to live like gods on a Mount Olympus. My friends, it's in the policy papers, it's in the documents, and in a film coming out at a later date, I will expand on what their final plans are. But it's actually on the record. Use your common sense and resist them. You've seen the historical record. You've seen the facts of government-sponsored and controlled terrorism in the final decades of the 20th century, going into the new millennium in 2001. This is a call to arms, 
a call to the information war to wake up your friends, your family, people in your community, your churches, your universities, your schools, and to realize what we're facing. My friends, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming and cannot be denied. All you need to do is check out all the information we have presented here. Look at elites throughout history. Their pleasure, their enjoyment is feeding upon populations, controlling them. We're dealing with control freaks. You have to learn about human history. You have to look around you and study the systems of power that surround you and get outside the paradigm, outside the box, and educate yourself on these facts. Then you need to begin to educate others and to resist this system. And whatever you do, never turn in your firearms. We're trying to fix these problems peaceably, but we do have every right to defend ourselves and our families from this tyranny. Because you see, this is a warning to everyone. If we are unable to defeat this new world order, the terror attacks are going to escalate. They're going to get worse until the United Nations program for an 80% world population reduction is actually realized. So you have to study this. You have to look at the facts. You have to get out the word. You have to make it the issue in your community if you're going to defeat this system. More terror attacks are coming, and it's up to you to get the word out of who's behind them. Because by doing that, we're able to shine the spotlight on these creatures and show how they're using it to get more power and control, and then they lose the power they have over us. No longer are they our loving saviors just taking our rights away for our best interest. They're the bloodthirsty, evil tyrants that they are in the minds of the men and women out there and then their illusion is shattered. But if you don't shatter that illusion of control, it's over for America. It's over for the world. And it means absolute, total dehumanization. We need Paul Revere's all across this country, black, white, old, young, to fight for this republic and against these slave masters. God bless you all.